Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to, New Amer to the New America Foundation and to our policy forum this afternoon on spectrum sharing and the implementation of the PCAST Spectrum Report recommendations. I'm uh, Alan Davidson, uh, the new director of the Open Technology Institute here at the New America Foundation, and I'm particularly delighted to be welcoming uh, this panel and this session on a topic that is near and dear to the hearts of many of us at New America. It is a very exciting time for wireless and spectrum policy. User demand is exploding for mobile broadband data. We've got growth of over 60 percent per year. Uh, we know that this area of policy is becoming more and more important to everyday Americans. And uh, the New America Wireless Future Project has been at the forefront of advocating for more unlicensed and spectrum band sharing for over a decade. So we're very glad to be sponsoring this event today. I will say, um, I guess to many Americans, the words 200-page government report uh, are probably more synonymous with other words like paperweight or doorstop or kindling. Uh, we're not used to getting a lot out of our government reports. But every now and then, a report comes along that um, you know, captures a brilliant new concept or excites the imagination, spurs actual government action. And uh, the PCAST 2012 Spectrum Report was just such a report. It crystallized, it put weight behind a elegant, an elegant and powerful idea that spectrum sharing, new spectrum sharing technologies, could radically improve our utilization of our spare spec spectrum resources and in the process spur real growth and real technology leadership in our industry. It holds out today the promise of creating an achievable approach to dealing with the demand for wireless communications that we face. And the report itself provided a set of detailed and practical recommendations to actually realize this potential. So the rep this report is a rare case of a federal committee proposing a breakthrough to a critical policy challenge and having an immediate impact. Nearly two years later, after the release of the report in 2012, we're delighted to welcome a distinguished set of speakers to discuss how the administration and the FCC are implementing these recommendations. Um, and to talk about the importance of this to our nation's economy. We're especially pleased to have several members of the original PCAS committee. Uh, Greg Mundy is here, um, uh, Mark Gorenberg. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Milo Medin, who was an uh, invited uh, expert. Uh, we've got Tom Powers from the White House, John Leibovitz from the FCC, uh, and Jason Furman will be joining us shortly, from, who is chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. So in other words, we have a a star-studded lineup for you here today. Um, just a few quick programming notes. This is going to be live streamed. This is being live streamed uh, on the New America website, and we'll have it archived there if you'd like to see it later. We invite you to tweet about it. I think we're using the hashtags pound PCAST and pound spectrum. Um, so have at it. Um, to moderate this intrepid group, we have Michael Calabrese who is the director of the Wireless Futures Project here at New America. He was also one of the invited experts who helped draft the PCAST report, and he has been a tireless advocate, as many of you know, in this space for quite a while. So please join me in welcoming Michael and our distinguished panel. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks, Alan. And it's, it's great to have, have Alan on board now as uh, as the director of our Open Technology Institute and of tech, tech policy here at New America in general, it's uh, rare to have someone with uh, so much experience both in the public interest and the corporate world uh, back at, uh, you know, here at New America. So um, I won't repeat, uh, you know, I would just like, like to second everything that, that Alan said about uh, what an unusual, um, unusually impactful report the PCAST uh, uh, put forward back in July 2012 uh, initially, and it was an, a, a tremendous amount of work, and we have uh, actually, you know, a, a few of the people who did that work uh, here today, which is terrific. It was uh, a real breakthrough, and, and I think also a tribute to the PCAST uh, leadership team that they involved um, the White House, 
uh, the rest of the White House, led by Tom Power, uh, the FCC, uh, where John Leibovitz was the uh, liaison, uh, and NTIA as well, in, uh, in that process, which I think made it much easier uh, for it to, to actually come out in a practical way and, uh, as you'll hear in this event, uh, move toward implementation. So I'd like to uh, uh, introduce first uh, Tom Power, uh, who is the Deputy uh, uh, Chief Technology Officer for Telecommunications in the White House Office on Science and Technology Policy. He came to the White House uh, from the Department of Commerce, where he served as Chief of Staff to Larry Strickling, the Assistant Secretary and Administrator of NTIA. NTIA, of course, uh, coordinates federal spectrum uh, use and assignments and use. And so Tom, uh, you know, had that, that great background coming in. Uh, he was also an advisor to PCAST during the entire process. So, Tom, you're up. Thank you, uh, Michael and Alan, and congratulations to both Alan and New America for your new relationship. That's terrific. And, and especially uh, Michael and the New America team that have uh, been so uh, forward thinking on spectrum uh, issues. It's been really important to our administration. Um, we have, uh, as, as everyone in this room knows, been pretty active on that front with the presidential memorandum back in uh, 2010. Uh, uh, setting uh, a course to free up 500 megahertz of spectrum for wireless broadband, uh, the American Jobs Act, the spectrum provisions there, which morphed into the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, the 2013 Presidential Memorandum, encouraging greater sharing and efficiency on the federal side, um, and of course all the work of the FCC and the and the PCAST report. I'm still a little bit in uh, in shock over uh, the announcement by David Letterman yesterday that he's uh, going to be retiring. Uh, almost didn't make it today, and I was scouring around trying to come up with you know stupid wireless tricks or or uh, a, a top ten list of of new wireless ideas, and someone just proposed one to me, which was we put the wires back on the mics. But I, that's uh, <laughs> might solve some things. But um, so uh, we have uh, we have plenty of work streams uh, that have been initiated under the memoranda, under the legislation, under uh, the FCC rulemakings. Uh, a lot to talk about. I wanted to focus on a couple things. Uh, specifically that have been spawned by the PCAST report. And, you know, just to put it in context, at the highest level, uh, the PCAST report just reflected sort of a basic observation about what happens when you have increasing demand for a finite resource. The traditional approach uh, had been that we find uh, bands that are appealing to the commercial sector. You pick up the federal systems, move them up the band somewhere, drop them down, and then you freed up the, uh, the old federal band for commercial use. Um, that obviously doesn't create more spectrum. It just sort of moves the pieces around the chessboard. Um, and it takes a lot of time and it costs money. And those, both those are imposed on carriers and, and uh, other wireless providers and ultimately <laughs> on the customers and users. So, you know, the PCAS was simply asking the question, isn't there a, a better way, a smarter way, a more efficient use of federally assigned spectrum so that uh, commercial interests and users uh, can exploit available spectrum more quickly and more cheaply? Um, there are a lot of things we can point to out of the PCAST report that have, uh, that have uh, taken root since the issuance of the report, a lot of the recommendations that have uh, really taken, um, uh, become concrete. Uh, the, the first one I would point to, obviously, is the spectrum access system that the PCAST uh, recommended. Uh, John Leibovitz is here, and I'm sure he's going to tell us some more about that, so I, I won't get into it in too much detail, but, but obviously this was a way of uh, starting with a, let's say, a federally assigned band where the, you've got federal users, finding opportunities in there for shared use, creating a three-tiered system. So you have uh, the feds sort of as the incumbents, the, a, a, some kind of licensed uh, scheme at the second level, and then uh, unlicensed at the third level. Um, I will let John get into the details. Very excited uh, that Chairman Wheeler uh, this week circulated an item uh, to his fellow commissioners for a possible action at the April meeting. But just the idea that, you know, it was July of 2012 that the PCAST issued their report. It was December of 2012 that the FCC put it into a notice of proposed rulemaking, and now we're, uh, we're on the verge of seeing it um, uh, as a uh, report in order, which is uh, just fantastic work to John and his team. Um, I think that's uh, one example, and, I, and I, I'll pause just for a second. It's one example of a really change in attitude we've seen in D.C. Um, how the PCAST has helped 
changed the dialogue and brought much greater collaboration between the government sector and the private sector and even among federal interests. You know, a lot of these spectrum decisions historically get decided in silos within the agencies. You're seeing much greater collaboration uh, on all fronts and a lot of a lot of great effort within the agencies in tough uh, budget times. Um, it's always uh, risky to start singling people out, but certainly Terry Takai, the CIO at the Defense Department, and her team have been doing terrific work. And and the guy who actually still signs my paycheck, Larry Strickling, and I would say it anyway, but uh, who's uh, who's uh, coordinating things at NTIA, and and the work of the federal agencies is is reflected in a lot of what the FCC is now able to do. Whether you talk about the uh, 3.5 gigahertz ruling. Um, the other uh, big report in order this week in the 1755 ban being freed up um, by the feds. Uh, there's an ongoing proceeding um, looking at 195 megahertz in the 5 gigahertz ban that uh, the feds freed up. We had the H block auction earlier this year. Uh, the other 5 gigahertz order uh, from this week. Uh, and of course, the broadcast incentive auction. So, uh, so much going on. Uh, another idea I think spawned by the PCAST that uh, was uh, considered in the 1755 rulemaking is, is this concept of reciprocal sharing. You know, we talk about finding opportunities in federal assignments where the spectrum is not being used and leveraging that for commercial uh, opportunities. There's a there's the flip side of that too. We have uh, situations where uh, when a carrier is licensed, they of course build out uh, based on demand, and that means not necessarily building out to the full geographic uh, scope of their license. Uh, from the get-go. So there's opportunities there, and you might find opportunities, particularly in rural areas where you have a, a some kind of government operation, a base or a, a test range, uh, where the the sharing can work in reverse. The commission raised that in the uh, for the 2155 band is, as part of the AWS3 uh, rulemaking. Um, I think, uh, as you probably know, the uh, NTIA weighed in on behalf of the Defense Department and the other agencies and said we're we're not quite ready to to nail that down to come up with specific rules yet. It's uh, I think it's a live option, um, but uh, but uh, NTIA did ask that we that the commission defer uh, on that for now. But it's a uh, another um, innovative idea that uh, that I think we can give credit to the PCAS for. Um, another effort that that is uh, under underway at NTIA is. Uh, taking a close look uh, and, and making a real quantitative assessment of how the agencies use the spectrum assigned to them. Um, you know, and again, this goes back to the, the underlying theme of the, F, of the uh, PCAST report that we, rather than picking up federal systems and moving them, let's look for opportunities where they, where they lie. Um, and of, of course, there's anecdotal evidence we've heard of you know, agencies that have spectrum assignments, the system is retired and they keep the assignment different opportunities like that. The agencies, you know, for their part say, you might not find as much as you think you're going to find. Uh, but that's the question. Uh, and, and rather than pursuing it in this siloed way, let's look at this in a coordinated way. So in the uh, presidential memorandum, uh, we directed NTIA to create a framework by which agencies would uh, do a real quantitative assessment uh, of, of how they're using the spectrum. Um, you can, you can look at, uh, uh, you know, w there are calls for spectrum inventories where you, you could say, well, we'll look at 1755 to 1780, and here are a bunch of assignments to DOD, and here are some to DHS, and here are some to DOJ, but it doesn't tell you much about the actual usage. And so that's what we were trying to get at here, because to, to free it up, we have to find it and identify it first. Um, and so what NTI is doing is um, they're going to start with bands that uh, they've already identified as being uh, uh, probably the, the, more one, the more amenable to commercial use and require the agencies to report on what that actual usage looks like from a temporal and geographic component. Um, and then that, that will kickstart uh, a process to look even more closely at those bands to see what kind of commercial exploitation might be able to be made of them. Uh, and then eventually we're going to take that same process and blend it into all the spectrum assignments that are out there. Uh, when uh, NTIA issues an assignment to a federal agency, um, they have to come in and basically re-up it or renew it every five years or ten years, depending on the nature of the system. And as part of that process now, NTIA will require them to add a little bit more information on how they're actually using the band. Uh, in our presidential memorandum uh, of last year, we also directed uh, NTIA to set up a pilot program to do actual monitoring in the field. 
to, to measure spectrum usage. There have been efforts, uh, in fact, I think New America sponsored one uh, a while back, uh, and there are other efforts going on all over the place, but this would uh, complement the idea of having agencies report individually. This would complement that by having a real world uh, pilot program in some geographic area actually uh, listening in. Uh, we've, uh, uh, NTI has put a uh, proposal out for public comment, has gotten public comment in. We've actually, uh, part of the president's FY15 budget for uh, NTIA would include uh, funding for this program. We got to get that budget through Congress, of course. Um, and it's, you know, it's trickier uh, than it might sound. Uh, in, in some cases, what a federal system doing is actually just listening, uh, listening for uh, potential threats from across the ocean or from outer space. Uh, and so just because you don't hear anything doesn't mean there isn't some activity going on there. So that's one of the challenges uh, uh, there, but NTIA is, is working hard um, uh, both on the reporting requirement and, and eventually to get the uh, pilot program set up. Um, another recommendation uh, from the PCAS report uh, finds its uh, concrete uh, result in the Spectrum Policy Team, the White House Spectrum Policy Team. That's co-chaired now by uh, my boss, the CTO, Todd Park, and Jeff Zients, the new uh, chair of the National Economic Council. Uh, the the uh, point, I guess, of the Spectrum Policy Team is really to bring more resources to bear and more coordination on attacking all these issues. Uh, and supporting NTIA and the other agencies in their work. The other members of the White House Spectrum Policy Team, in addition to OSTP and NEC, are the Office of Management and Budget, the uh, Council of Economic Advisors, and uh, the National Security Staff. Uh, the Spectrum Policy Team, in turn, is looking at uh, some of the other substantive recommendations of the PCAST, and uh, there are several. Uh, one of the more uh, interesting ones is this issue of agency incentives. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know, the current approach essentially uh, has the agencies estimate their relocation costs in anticipation of an auction, and then the FCC sets a reserve price that has to be at least 110 percent of the estimated costs, and we have a successful auction if that uh, number is hit or exceeded, and then the funds can be used to compensate the agencies. Uh, for the agencies, it's kind of a status quo. They sort of get back to where they started, so it's not exactly a, a, a strong incentive. The 2012 Act helped a little bit on this. It, it specifically said that uh, agencies in, in preparing to relo relocate uh, could uh, invest in state-of-the-art equipment. They don't have to replace 20-year-old hardware with 20-year-old hardware. Uh, but there were still some limitations on that. It's whether it was required to... Uh, maintain comparable capabilities, uh, uh, and and only if any uh, uh, increases in functionality were, were incremental or incidental. Um, the PCAS uh, came up with a new approach on this and uh, uh, something called spectrum currency. So the idea is essentially that you, uh, you create a, a separate currency. So as agencies uh, relinquish spectrum, they get credits for that currency. And then over time, that those credits uh, build up, and then they can use that and turn it into real dollars to do real acquisitions. Uh, the the trick, uh, one of the one of the keys to this is to sort of separate it from the standard budget pro uh, practice and process, because otherwise you run the risk of an agency getting credit only to have it taken away when they go back into the to the budget cycle. So it's looking longer term and keeping it separate from the from the budget process. That uh, approach uh, has spawned a lot of thinking, and uh, uh, including uh, up on the Hill, where there are a couple bills now pending, uh, looking at different ways of providing incentives to agencies. Uh, Congresswoman Matsui and Congressman Guthrie introduced a bill back in December that would essentially take the broadcast incentive auction idea and apply it to agencies. So the agencies would be entitled to a share, a percentage of the auction revenues. And one of the interesting aspects of it is the money wouldn't necessarily go to relocation costs or spectrum costs. In fact, the money could go to anything that was the subject of a sequester cut. So much more flexibility for the agencies and yet still limited to uh, items that have been authorized and approved and funded by Congress and, and uh, OMB previously. Um, there was a more recent bill, Senator Kirk uh, introduced uh, a, a much broader look at, at a number of aspects of spectrum policy, which I won't get into the details of, other than to mention that uh, in this case, the Secretary of Defense, when uh, DOD uh, gets funding back, 
it says they could invest in uh, state-of-the-art equipment regardless, if necessary, to maintain comparable capability if the defense secretary felt that was appropriate. So again, just a little more flexibility uh, for the agency to uh, uh, to, to uh, exercise in taking these funds. And I'm, you know, I'm not here to comment on any of the bills specifically. I just I find it interesting that we are seeing so much activity and thought uh, being uh, brought to bear on this issue of uh, incentives, especially um, since uh, the release of the PCAST report. Uh, the Spectrum Policy Team itself is looking at this. We uh, put out a request for information back in February uh, seeking public comment. Uh, we had also accompanied that with a report that we had commissioned uh, to, to that, that just sort of summarized uh, various approaches, various proposals to incentives. We will be um, uh, making our own recommendations uh, later this year based on the, uh, the input we've got. Um, other PCAST recommendations are being uh, implemented as well, uh, particularly uh, I might just highlight a couple more, uh, more due diligence by agencies under OMB guidance in designing and procuring systems so as to be more efficient, being more flexible up front. Um, you know, to give you one example, there are systems, uh, expensive systems, whether they are uh, jets or satellites or, uh, or any number of other systems that are tuned, the radios are tuned to, to work on one band. And so when we get to a point of trying to be more flexible, it's a huge expense. You can imagine a satellite. Uh, you, can't, you can't do a truck roll, you know, to the satellite. Um, well, you, you can, but somebody has to be there between 10 and 2 on Thursday to let the guy in. So um, <laughs> there's not a lot of spectrum humor. There just isn't. Um, uh, anyway, we, we want to give more flexibility, uh, ha have the agencies more think about flexibility when they're doing their procurements. You, of course, you run into a challenge here, which is if an agency says, I want to invest in and procure a new system, it's going to be $100 million, but for $125 million, uh, I can get added spectrum flexibility. The folks at OMB and on the Hill, the appropriators have to think about that because that's $25 million that could be going to... To, uh, to deficit reduction or something else. Um, but, uh, but OMB is coming up, has come out with new guidance uh, on this to make sure that uh, the agencies are verifying that they have at least thought through this process. You, you, it, it's hard to know. Um, every, every procurement will raise its own uh, issues, uh, but at least we want to make sure that they are verifying that they are thinking about these issues. Um, and then finally, uh, just greater collaboration between the federal and the commercial stakeholders. Uh, NIST and NTIA have announced plans to stand up a uh, Center for Advanced Communications at the Boulder Labs, which can be a real hub for both private and public uh, R&D in some of these areas. And finally, I guess probably the, the, the uh, last time I'll mention is uh, the uh, PCAST recommended the establishment of a test city, a, a real-world environment where you could uh, uh, carriers and other uh, 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 industry, industry players could try out uh, new models, new business models, new applications, new services. Uh, we've we've been uh, between NTIA, OSTP, the FCC. We've been looking at that. It seems like a lot of the tools are in place uh, through experimental licensing. Uh, for example, uh, industry could today uh, go and try to set this up. Maybe do an MOU with the right city who's willing to collaborate to be very flexible when it comes to. Uh, allowing installations on rooftops and bridges and so forth. Uh, but what we want to do is try to convene and kickstart that uh, and and make sure we got all the right stakeholders thinking collaboratively about that. So we're still kicking that around, but uh, you'll probably hear more about that uh, soon. Um, I will just uh, just by close by saying um, I uh, the PCAS has had a effects internationally um, a month or so ago. I sat down with a uh, professor from a French engineering school. She had previously served as uh, uh, the equivalent of an FCC commissioner, and she's been appointed by a uh, French cabinet minister to write a report on spectrum and spectrum sharing, and she wanted to talk all about the PCAS report and the administration's policy. And we got to the end of a long conversation, and she said, I just want to ask you one more question, which is, why is your president the only leader who talks about spectrum? Everywhere else in the world, including in Europe, it's a, just a dry topic. And uh, uh, she said, I'm writing this report. This is sort of the biggest deal going on in Europe, and nobody would know about this, but your, your president talks about spectrum. And I said, well, it's about the economy. And, uh, and she laughed, and she said, well, we have an economy. <laughs> um, and I said, well, 
you should be talking more about Spectrum. Um, so uh, it, it has been, as Alan said, the impact of this report really has been uh, unbelievable to watch, and it's been a great honor and pleasure and, and, and just fun to be in the middle of it. Uh, OSTP kind of hosts the PCAST administratively. Um, we, don't, we don't get to uh, edit what they say. Uh, they can bounce ideas off of us, but it's their, uh, it's their report. Uh, we don't have to follow what they say. Uh, but if they have good ideas, we do. And this has just been an amazing uh, 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 collaboration and an amazing result between what you've seen at NTIA, the agencies, and the FCC. And it's really great to have Craig Mundy and Mark uh, Gorenberg here, uh, who uh, were really instrumental in putting this thing together. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Jason Furman, who I think I saw come out <laughs> there. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Jason, uh, as you know, is the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. He has been uh, hugely instrumental in, in shaping spectrum policy uh, and a whole lot of other things. I don't know quite how he does that, but uh, it's, been, it's been a great uh, honor and pleasure for me to be able to work with him, and he's been a great resource for me. So let me turn it over to the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Jason Furman. Uh, thanks, Tom, and, uh, and thanks, Michael, for, for organizing this. And why don't I start where you, um, where you ended, Tom, and just say that the PCAST report has been um, you know, enormously important in our work. And it's been enormously important, I think, for two reasons. Uh, number one is the quality of ideas in the report thanks to Mark and Craig and, and, and many others and the work they did. But just as important, there's an awful lot of great reports that get written, including maybe even some great reports by, by PCAST. And this one has really had um, a lot of champions in the administration and no one more active, energetic, and thoughtful in championing it than um, Tom Power. And um, you know, I've learned so much from him in that context. It has the enthusiasm of a broad range of people, Larry Strickling, many others who have helped um, push it forward as well. Um, and Tom wasn't kidding you about the president and the president's interest in spectrum. I go to a lot of meetings on a wide range of topics with the president, and I don't think there are any meetings that are more exciting and energizing for him than um, PCAST meetings. And PCAST meetings usually, I'm, I'm serious, um, and PCAST meetings usually have a lot of topics on the agenda. And I think in the last one, for example, it was a jump ball as to what was more exciting for him, the discussion of um, untreatable infectious diseases or um, spectrum. And one of those was a really scary thing for our country, and the other was a really exciting opportunity. Uh, for our country, and the president charged us directly with pushing forward, um, you know, in particular on the test cities concept, um, which was one of the things in the report that was not um, in that initial presidential memorandum, and, um, and we've been doing that. You know, what I wanted to use, you know, more of my time, and how much time should I be using, Michael? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure what your schedule is. Oh, another, well, you know, 15 okay, minutes great. or so. And, and you can feel free to take questions at the end yep. or not if you want. Great. Um, what I wanted to use more time on, we'll have a little time for question, was to put a little bit of big picture context on this. And if you haven't read it yet, we have, um, you know, an entire discussion, entire chapter of our latest economic report of the president, which came out um, about a month ago, that is devoted to the topic of technology and the economy. And the reason we devoted an entire chapter to it is because technology shows up really importantly in growth, and it shows up really importantly in um, inequality. And so I wanted to give a little bit of a big picture about where all of this fits, um, and then drill back down. You know, one thing, um, since writing that chapter, um, Tomas Piketty, who is probably the leading researcher on inequality in the world, has written an enormous tome, Capital in the 21st Century. And it has some ideas about the role of growth and inequality that I think are really novel and interesting that he himself doesn't fully draw out. So um, that was something I wished I had thought of when we had written this and can put 
um, growth in the context of inequality that way um, as well. You know, stepping back and, you know, this is something I've gone over a lot. If you look at labor productivity, the output per hour for workers, it grew at a 2.7% rate in the decades after World War II. A lot of that was pent-up inventions um, during the course of the war that were deployed to civilian use afterwards. Some of that were public investments, um, not very high-tech ones like the interstate highway system. And a lot of that came grinding to a halt around the early 70s, in part due to the disruptions related to the oil shocks and productivity growth, which had been 2.7 percent a year, slowed to 1.4 percent a year, and stayed at about that rate for another 20 years. And you know, at the time, this was puzzling to people because people are excited about technology now, but people were also really excited about computers and technology in the 1980s, and it seemed amazing you know, that you could put a computer on your desk, um, for example. And even with all that happening, um, you weren't seeing it in the productivity statistics. That all changed back again starting around the mid-1990s and what we called then the new economy that in part was premised on information technology helped bring the productivity growth back up to 2.3 percent. So not as much as it had been in the decades after World War II, but um, significantly above what it was in those um, the sort of slower, not quite lost, but slower decades um, after, after the oil shocks. If you drill down and ask yourself what the source of this productivity growth is, it is, um, you know, about half of it is due to what economists call total factor productivity growth or multi-factor productivity growth. So that's not extra capital, which helps with productivity. It's not improved quality of labor, which helps with productivity. But it's how much you can get out of a given quantity of capital and labor. And that's what grew so quickly after World War II. That's what grew so slowly after the oil shock. And that's what picked up again. And the policies in this area, when it comes to spectrum, the PCAST um, in this particular area is very much focused on total factor productivity growth and multi-factor productivity growth. At the same time um, that you care about growth, we care very much about whether that growth is translating into higher incomes for you know, working Americans for the middle class. And that process isn't automatic. In fact, some of the innovation and technologies we've had have done more to complement high-skilled workers than lower-skilled workers. And so that's increased the demand for high-skilled workers boosted their productivity and raised their wages. Um, and at the same time, it's put those pressures in an opposite direction on lower wage workers and has thus helped increase um, inequality. The solution to that, um, and this has long been understood, isn't slowing the growth rate of technology, but is, first of all, better equipping people to use that technology so you have more of a supply of skilled workers, um, which means more people have the opportunity to go up. And the inequality is caused by the disconnect of the expanded demand without the increased supply to meet it is what raises inequality. So expanding the supply of skilled workers and everything from preschool through high school redesign through access to college and improved training are an important part of our agenda um, in that regard. But part of it is also taking technology and using it as a force to directly expand opportunity and reduce inequality. And perhaps the most important example of that right now is the Connect Ed initiative that the president has been pushing forward and that the FCC um, is playing a critical part in. And that's all about taking technology and taking advantage of improved um, wired and wireless broadband, the lowered price, increasingly low price of devices, and using that to make sure that everyone um, has the type of educational 
opportunities they had. You know, everything I've said so far is the relatively standard, although not as appreciated as it should be, story behind productivity growth and inequality over the last several decades, and it's the story that we embodied in the economic report. The newer twist that certainly I'm trying to get my own head around um, is what I referred to in these important ideas that were put forward by uh, Tomas Piketty in this very important book. And his fundamental insight is that inequality is caused by two things. One is labor income being less equally distributed, which is what I was just talking about. But the second is a shift in the share of income. And in the last about 20 years, we've seen a fall in the share of income that goes to labor and a rise in the share of income that goes to capital. The reason that matters is that capital is distributed um, even less equally than labor. So if more income shifts from labor to capital, that is going to increase the amount of inequality. The question is, what does that have to do with the PCAST report? The answer is that an important determinant of the amount of income that goes to labor versus capital is the growth rate in the economy. And there's a simplistic way to think about that, which is that your wealth, on average, grows with the rate of return in the economy, which economists would use the letter R for. And your labor income, in general, will grow with the growth rate of the economy. As the economy grows, your, your wages you know, roughly grow. Anything that means the growth rate is slowing means those wages are going to grow more slowly. If interest rates stay about the same and over very long periods of time, they roughly do, or rates of return to capital um, roughly do, that's going to mean wealth, capital accumulation, and you know, what you can live off of, essentially investing in markets, is going to grow much more quickly than wages. <coughs> Overall income is going to shift towards capital, and that's a deep structural force driving an increase in inequality. You know, conversely, what that means is if you can get your growth rate up and raise it through these types of innovations, then you can have, in your total national income, um, wages growing more quickly. You can start to slow down or reverse the shift in the share of income going um, to capital and push it back towards labor. And all else being equal, that means you would have reduced inequality. And what that means is rather than just the traditional story of growth helps lift everyone up. So even if you have just as much inequality, more growth means at least the bottom and the middle are doing better. Um, more growth might do that, but it also might be um, a force for re reducing the gap between the top and the bottom, especially when it comes to the shares of their income um, that come from capital and come from labor. And so I think all of that underscores why you know, the most central thing in economic policy over the medium and long run is our productivity growth rate. The most essential thing in that is technology. And in that area, um, one of the most important and exciting developments is what wireless broadband has the capability for doing in terms of freeing us up in terms of mobile devices, the role they play in education, you know, in the context of Connect Ed, in energy, in healthcare, in um, you know, in you know, leisure time, um, in production processes, and in the economy more broadly. When you know, I think of the role of government policy in this area, you know, I organize it into four categories. The first is the government plays an important role investing in R&D, and we all know um, the origins of the internet and DARPA. You know, when it comes specifically to the issue of spectrum sharing, you know, DOD is, um, you know, thanks in large part to the PCAST report and thanks in large part 
um, to people like Tom and the Spectrum management team that have really been helping to work with them and push them along um, have been focused on research in this area. And we also have $100 million through NSF, DARPA, Commerce, and others um, that's going towards this type of research. The second area of public policy is catalyzing um, private investment. And there's a lot the government can do, but there's a lot the private sector can and should do. And you know that's anything from um, from tax policies like the R and D tax credit, or increasing the incentive to innovate rather than litigate, which the um, president's proposals on patent reform. Um, something very similar to which passed the House and is working its way through the Senate are designed to do. The third area of public policy is catalyzing um, that infrastructure. And when it comes to roads, there's not a lot of catalyzing of the infrastructure. A lot of that's federally financed. Here, the vast bulk of the infrastructure is privately financed. And you know, I've described our approach to this, you know, taking a page from our approach to uh, you know, another policy area, um, as an all of the above approach. That, um, that exclusive use license spectrum um, plays an important role. That unlicensed spectrum um, plays an important role. That um, shared spectrum plays an important role. And we basically would like to have more of all of these. And you know, moreover, they don't. Um, I mean, they can compete with each other, and competing with each other can actually be healthy and good, and something that we want to encourage in the economy. Um, but they can also complement each other in terms of, for example, Wi-Fi offloading a lot of the traffic that otherwise would have been um, on an exclusive licensed use, or um, shared spectrum um, and non-shared spectrum. Um, when it comes to shared spectrum, that model of the government having the three-tiered model of the government having first access, um, something licensed coming below it, and something unlicensed coming below that, I think is one of many um, you know intriguing models that have been put push, put forward. And you know, we're going to need to invest more in technology to make those work. We're also going to. Uh, need to invest more in economic theories, design of auctions, design of property rights, and a set of incentives so that people know, you know what they do and, and, and don't have um, in that regard as well. And some of that work is underway, but much more of it um, remains to be done. You know, finally, um, you know, the fourth area of public policy ties back to that framework I was starting in the beginning, which is um, we have to ensure that the benefits of these innovations um, you know, are shared. And that's something that you know, partly happens automatically. You know, the benefits of something like Wikipedia or Google are you know, very broadly accessible to people all across the United States and all across the world and have been enormously democratizing in reducing the gap in knowledge between you know, the most fortunate and the least fortunate. But uh, you know, other technologies and innovations can go the opposite way and can threaten to increase those gaps. And so being mindful of that, and, and as I said, the Connect Ed initiative is the best example, but it's not the only example. Um, what was done through BTOP, what's been done by the FCC through uh, BTOP and our RUS, what's been done um, by the FCC through universal service reform and other areas are about um, spreading the benefits of broadband. And those are efforts that going forward um, can rely not just on the ways they've been done in the past, but should be thinking about. Um, you know, the innovations and ideas the PCAST has had in spectrum sharing and what role they can play um, in that as well. So, you know, Tom um, you know, went through a lot of the nitty-gritty a lot better than I could have. Um, 
but you know this is very much a team effort and it's a team effort that is you know led not on a day-to-day -day basis um, by the president of the United States and um, he puts a lot of motivation behind all of us in doing it and um, you know we're going to keep pushing forward on the economics of it on the technology of it on just even I think a lot of progress people have dealt with the government would tell you just even on the internal management of the government and how our spectrum users um, think about the spectrum they use and you know what can be done you know what can be done with it more effectively and um, you know we're going to do all that because this is one of the most important one of the important determinants of growth um, and of the degree to which uh, ordinary families benefit from that growth. So I'm happy to take a few questions. If they get too hard, um, I, I have at least one lifeline um, in the room, but uh, I can open it up. You asked why President Obama is involved in Spectrum. I, I was a consultant at one point to Vivian Redding when she was the European Zarina of uh, the European Union Zarina for Spectrum. Oh, can you be a little louder? Yeah, uh, I, Mike Marcus. I was one point was a consultant to Vivian Redding when she had, was European Commissioner for Information and Science. Uh, she now is, has different portfolio in the European Union. She was very interested in Spectrum, but the problem basically was that the U.S. had has more serious structural spectrum problems than Europe does, and particularly the 1978 creation of NTIA sort of isolated spectrum management from national goals, unfortunately. So I think you're moving back in the right direction, but I think the, pro the reason why the President got involved is that, frankly, he had to get involved, and I think he's doing a good job uh, moving in the right direction, but we, had a, we have a unique problem in the United States with the bifurcation of two separate agencies, and the, pen the pendulum was moving back the other way, thanks to the effort you, you described, but that's probably the reason why uh, the President has spectrum on his tongue, as European counterparts don't, because they didn't have the same problems we had. I think that's an interesting point, so thanks for it. Yeah. Uh, Gerald Chandler, uh, how much effect do you think NAFTA, uh, particularly integration between Mexico and the U.S., has had on increased inequality in the U.S.? This, Tom, do you want to? <laughs> want to take that one? Um, you know, I think. Um, I have not studied NAFTA in particular. There are two things one would care about in trade and globalization and inequality. One is the broader trend towards greater integration with the rest of the world, you know, globalization, what that does for inequality. And then second is what a particular agreement like TPP with our Pacific partners or TTIP with our European partners would do to inequality. And those two questions can have different answers. I think on the first question, um, globalization expanded trade have played a role in um, increased inequality. And they've played a role um, for the conventional trade theory supply and demand reasons that are the analog of the technological supply and demand I was talking about before. And, um, you know, our comparative advantage in the United States is skilled workers. And as trade expands, it increases the reward to those skilled workers, and it puts some unskilled workers um, into greater competition. And that creates a challenge for inequality. It creates a, oh, sorry. He has, s he actually pays less attention to globalization. Not because he doesn't think it's a factor, he cites it as an important one, but I think has less original analysis to contribute, um, you know, in that area. But, so I think globalization's played a role. 
I think it's also played a role in increased living standards and the cheaper things we can buy and the higher paid jobs and overall growth rate. So there's a lot of things on the other side of the ledger. I think a lot of that trend, though, wasn't even a, wasn't a function of any particular agreement. It was just a function of the whole set of things that have increased trade links um, between countries. When you look at particular agreements like TPP, for example, um, we're seeking enforceable labor standards, which would bring up the labor standards in countries um, like Vietnam. That, and those are countries we would have traded with regardless of the agreement by raising their labor standards. That can help potentially reduce inequality and make that labor agreement inequality reducing. But I think we probably want to stick more to the topic at hand. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm inferring here. I'll, I'll ask, one, okay. I'll ask one last question if I can. Uh, so Jason, by the way, thank you tremendously for your leadership. You were with us all the way through, including uh, when we rolled it out in the White House in July of 2012, a very forceful speech on it. You, uh, you've also, by the way, look great. You've lost, I think, about 60 <laughs> pounds since the report came out. So I, I think since everybody's giving us credit, so much credit here today, can we take, we'll take some credit for making you happy and being part of that process, too. Um, but I wanted to ask you about uh, your comment about short and medium-term licenses, economic theory, you know, some of the things you're starting to look at, to look at the uh, potential growth streams, revenue streams, innovation mm -hmm. streams that come out of that. And, I was wondering if you wanted to talk any more about that now, or should we just consider that a work in progress? I think it's later? a work in progress. My colleague Dave Balin from the Council of Economic Advisors, who's our senior economist on this issue, um, has been spending a lot of time on it. But um, I don't, you know, I, I don't feel a hundred percent ready for prime time. But we've certainly been thinking about, you know, how you do, how you, we, we know how to auction off effectively unlimited rights. That's what we do right now. How do you auction off limited rights? How do people know exactly what they're buying? How do you, you know, take advantage of more modern, efficient technologies to do, you know, auctions in, in different ways? And a lot of this is in the purview of the FCC and others are the ones whose job it is to figure that out. But, you know, both inside government and outside government, um, we need to be putting our best thought into it. And, you know, you just look at the way you know, ad space and eyeballs are auctioned off on the internet by the second and by the eyeball and wonder, you know, we're not sort of ready to do that in the next year, but is that where we're going to be 10 years from now? What would it, 20 years from now, what would it take to get there? Um, you know, I think you want to be, you know, sort of both practical, but some, especially those of us that aren't designing the next set of auction rules and CA has nothing to do with the next set of auction rules, you know, have a little bit of a luxury of being a little more blue sky and thinking, a little bit further ahead about where you might want to drive things in the future. Oh. I may need to. Uh, you can. Uh, you, yeah. can, you can take your microphone back. Move on though, but uh, um, I want to thank you very much for coming over on what must be a busy day with the uh, the job numbers out and and so on and uh, and thanks for making this an economic issue, which it absolutely is. Okay. Thank you. Michael. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I know too. It's interesting on the on the economic front uh, that there was a just occurred to me to mention it, just a few weeks ago a, a, a study came out, which is probably I think the best one to date, uh, by Raul Katz, a professor at Columbia Business School, which estimated for unlicensed spectrum, which is one species of shared spectrum, uh, that it contributes, estimating that it contributes about two hundred and twenty billion dollars a year to the American economy uh, in terms of activity generated and, and its value. So um, it came out from Wi-Fi forward. So that's worth looking at as well. Um, uh, next we have John Leibovitz, who is the uh, Deputy Bureau Chief of the FCC's Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, uh, also Spectrum Advisor to the Chairman, uh, a, an additional title he acquired when Chairman Wheeler uh, came into office. And John, uh, you know, he knows all about this because he served as the FCC's liaison uh, to PCAST. Uh, and as Tom Power uh, mentioned before, and I would like to reiterate the, the incredible speed with which John has uh, and his team, including Julie Knapp, who, who is here, the chief engineer at the FCC, head of OET, uh, the tremendous speed at which they've moved this through in less than two years to a to circulate a very detailed FNPRM, uh, which is you know close to, 
close to a final order, although that, that won't be adopted for a while yet, more comments to come. But nevertheless, I mean, if you compare that to TV white space, where the original notice of inquiry was in 2002, and it took about a decade altogether. So this is really uh, a, new, uh, a new world for the FCC, and, and we're very happy to be the beneficiaries of, uh, uh, of that sort of um, uh, you know, competent management and, and passion. So uh, John? Thanks, Michael, and uh, thanks to New America for, for hosting this. Um, I want to thank, all, again, all the people who worked on the PCAST. Many of them were here, and it was, a, it was really great fun working on it. I also wanted just to thank Jason Furman. I think, you know, many of us who work in the field always have, you know, we talk about how technology improves everyone's lives, makes things better, but it's, it's usually just intuition. So it's, it's very interesting to hear someone connect the dots like, like that. Um, from you know causally, how does how do how does you know uh, this arcane topic spectrum actually affect people's lives? And and I found that very meaningful personally. Um, so I'm here to talk about the uh, how we are at the FCC working to implement the PCAST report. Um, we have uh, as been has has been mentioned a live proceeding um, which we started at the end of 2012, um, which is aimed at uh, creating a new set of rules for a new type of service we're calling the Citizens Broadband Radio Service. Um, and it's uh, focused in the 3.5 gigahertz band. I'll talk about that a little more. Um, uh, but uh, you know, we are getting to the point soon where we will be able to, I think, to uh, implement some rules and uh, start to see these ideas in action in a new way. And, and we're very excited about that. Um, so PCAST report, um, everyone I'm sure has read it, uh, knows all the recommendations by heart. I wanted to point to the single most important uh, part of the report, which is uh, always with many, many important works, is the acknowledgments. Um, if you read the, uh, the acknowledgments, you'll see one of the uh, invited experts was our was Tom Wheeler, who is now the chairman of the FCC. So um, uh, uh, the Chairman Wheeler gave a, a, a speech almost two weeks ago where he talked extensively about the PCAST uh, report, his role in it, um, the 3.5 gigahertz band proceeding and made it very clear this is a very high priority for him. Um, he uh, you know, said it was not coincidental that he was served as a part of the committee and, and is interested in pushing it forward. He really believes in the ideas, and so um, that's why those of us who work for him are, are working hard on it. Um, wanted to, um, you know, before getting to the PCAST report, just sort of credit NTIA, our brother agency, sister agency, sibling agency, um, in, the, in the executive branch. Um, in 2010, uh, NTIA put out a report, which many of you are familiar with, uh, which identified new bands that could be available uh, for wireless broadband. And this was pursuant to the president's directive to find uh, 500 megahertz for broadband. One of those bands that they put on the table um, was the 3550 to 3650 megahertz band. Um, and they recommended reallocating it uh, on a shared basis with the existing systems that live there, uh, which are primarily military radar systems. That idea uh, created, in some sense, a platform that could be um, leveraged in the PCAST report, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, well, actually, the next slide. So the P one of the, one of the uh, just a few quotes from the PCAST report. Uh, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, Our highest recommendation is that the president issue an executive order to prioritize 1,000 megahertz of federal spectrum for review and implementation to create the nation's first shared use spectrum superhighways. <laughs> The recommendations in this PCAST report are intended to provide a foundation for that goal or to institutionalize it as a model start of the next era for spectrum. And then down the page a little bit. Most promising would be four bands that total 950 contiguous megahertz between 2700 and 3650 megahertz. Combining these bands with the 3650, 3700 megahertz band, which is an already licensed FCC band, yields 1,000 potentially contiguous me megahertz or one gigahertz of shareable spectrum. So I think that contextualizes a little bit what's going on with 3.5 gigahertz is the first 100 or 150 megahertz in this 1,000 megahertz superhighway. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we think it's important to get it off the ground. At the heart of the PCAST recommendation, of course, is this idea of a spectrum access system. Uh, I think this is a concept that was built on top of a lot of the ideas and work that has come out of the TV white spaces proceeding. And obviously, that's really formative and, and, and important proceeding. Um, the idea basically being that there, uh, you know, if you look at spectrum management historically, it's a bunch of people 
working in windowless or mirrored windowed buildings uh, in Washington, D.C., um, uh, who administer rights to Spectrum. And uh, you know, if you want to petition for some of those rights, you have to file paper. It gets mailed to the, to the agency. They, a bunch of people study it. It takes a long time. What comes out, sometimes an authorization, sometimes a rejection, but it's a very, um, you know, it's a, it's a bureaucratic process. And I think you can think of, in some sense, that the uh, Spectrum Access System as being an attempt to automate a lot of that, uh, take advantage of uh, these new inventions called computers to uh, really speed it up and, and almost in a real-time way um, uh, authorize access to Spectrum in ways that was not possible, that is not possible given the, the, current, uh, the current, current process and institutions that we have now. So uh, the 3550 to 3650 band and the 3650 to 3700 band um, are the subject of FCC docket 12-354, the Citizens Broadband Service Proceeding. Um, we have two parts of this, of this uh, proceeding. There's a main proposal, which is the 100 megahertz that was recommended in the, in the PCAST report, but we have also have a supplemental proposal that encompasses the full 150 megahertz up to 3700. Um, I think we're very much uh, of the mind that, you know, uh, provided we can work out the rules in a way that satisfies everyone, um, that, that, that there's no reason why 150 megahertz shouldn't be in, uh, potentially in play here. And uh, obviously, the more spectrum you have, the more powerful the, uh, the uh, uh, proceeding can be in the long run. Uh, so um, let's just talk about where we've been quickly. We pro uh, proposed the notice of proposed, we issued a pro uh, notice of proposed rulemaking in December 12, 2012. Um, that had uh, essentially some of the key components of the PCAST framework in it. We had a three tier framework and so forth. Um, we held a technical workshop in a few months later in March. Uh, we uh, got comments from the community. We heard many things. One of the things we heard was that our the way in which we were conceiving of the second tier, the priority access tier, was a little too restrictive for many. So we uh, put a focus on that second tier and opened it up to a sort of a broader um, uh, construct. And that was uh, a commission level public notice that came out in November of 2013. Um, and then uh, just this January, we held a, I would say, a very successful uh, workshop on spectrum access system. What is a spectrum access system? What does it need to do? How would it work? Uh, it's a very sort of, in some sense, technical and challenging topic, yet there were people lined up out the door of the FCC, out the building, and it was uh, very well attended, and there was uh, a lot of excitement around that. Um, and so now we're in April, and the next step for us is we are going to, uh, at, the, uh, at the April commission meeting, the commissioners will be voting on a f further notice of proposed rulemaking. Now, in some sense, this sounds like a third in a series of notices. How exciting can that be? Um, but this is exciting. Let me tell you why. Um, the reason it's exciting is because the notice that we are proposing, uh, th th this notice is extremely detailed. It contains over 20 pages of draft rules and, in fact, would create a new rule part, uh, Part 96, which would establish the Citizens Broadband Radio Service and effectually, essentially effectuate the PCAST report. So um, this is very much, um, I think, an action-oriented um, uh, release. Uh, of course, has to be voted by the Commission, so everything I'm going to say is with that caveat that what we have in front of the commissioners now is a staff uh, recommendation and draft, but they're, of course, free to make changes. And, and uh, But, you know, it's definitely at a, a stage now where I think we're, we're tilting towards action. Um, we'll have more comment when this uh, thing is uh, voted out the door, if it is voted out the door. Um, but then I think there will be enough um, specificity in the, uh, in the proposal that um, it's a very clear line of sight to getting to an initial set of rules. So um, before I continue, just a little bit further, our, in the speech I mentioned before that uh, Chairman Wheeler gave uh, about two weeks ago, he mentioned a few sort of principles that informed the drafting of this further notice. I just wanted to repeat them quickly um, because uh, they're definitely pervasive throughout the item. Um, first, uh, the, uh, the, the further notice is definitely organized around this notion of three tiers, a three-tiered model, just like the PCAS report. Second, it conceives of a unified band across the 100 or 150 megahertz. It's not um, split into sub-bands. I think there's a general view that the spectrum sharing opportunity raised by the PCAST is one that um, is across larger bandwidths rather than uh, smaller bands, and in fact is in some ways going against the history of spectrum uh, allocations, which is towards very narrow uh, 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 channels and allocations. Third is a, is a sense of uh, flexibility of use. So the original notice that went out uh, about a year and a half ago um, focused on small cells. I think we definitely continue to think that small cells will be a core use case of the band. Um, 
And especially because uh, they're so efficient from a spectral, it, it, we have a great interest in spectral efficiency and, and spatial reuse is a, is a great thing. But one of the things the record that came back said very clearly to us is that many uh, interested stakeholders have a broader vision for the band that goes beyond small cells. And so um, rural uses, backhaul uses, uh, the question is how can they be made compatible with one another? And so the, the, the further notice definitely uh, uh, anticipates a broader set of uh, uses than, and use cases than just small cells. And lastly is this notion, I think, that in some ways Jason Furman alluded to a little bit, which is that it's, it's great to have good technology and new ideas through technology, but we also need to have an economic frame as well. Um, so we've put a fair amount of thought into, into how does uh, this proposal uh, read from an economic standpoint. And um, you know, I think it's the chairman's belief that you need to have this combination of, of new technology and smart technology, but also smart economics to make sure the incentives are right for people to use the technology in, in the right ways. And so that's embedded into the framework as well. So this is the, your guide to the rest of the uh, PowerPoint. Um, that there essentially is a representation of the, of the uh, further notice and also in some sense of the PCAST report. You've got your three tiers. Uh, of service and off to the side the spectrum access system which is of course governing uh, the rights and adjudicating between the three tiers. Um, we rename things a little bit in the FCC version of the of the PCAST uh, concept and the part of that has to do with just a conflict of terminology and trying to avoid confusing uh, double use of words that uh, mean one thing in regulation that might not have been intended in the PCAST report but the top you have the in incumbent access tier. These are the people who are that are there already that need to be protected in these bands. Uh, the priority access tier is this, uh, you know, uh, quality of service license tier. I'll talk about that in a minute. In a minute, and the and the bottom, maybe in perhaps appropriately, the the broadest part of the triangle is the general authorized access tier, which is uh, in some sense like an unlicensed access model. Uh, we in in our case, we in this case, we've actually proposed a slightly different legal mechanism, but the effect is essentially to allow for um, a democratic access to the band with a small d. Um, in, in the sense that um, anyone can just turn on the device and use it. Um, and the spectrum access system, of course, is, is, uh, is uh, regulating this whole thing. So talking about incumbent access, uh, what's in the band now? You've got military radars. You've got a small number of uh, satellite earth stations. And essentially what the uh, proposal would say, as it's drafted now, is that the bottom tiers of service have to protect those incumbents. They get protected. That's as simple as it is. And then uh, there's some details about how that protection happens. Uh, the next chart is a chart from the 2010 Fast Track report. Uh, many of you have seen this report, which shows different estimations of what sharing might look like uh, to accommodate the military radars. Um, I think uh, it's worth noting that this chart was it was drawn based on analysis that was based on some different technical assumptions. I think that most people. Uh, think will apply to this band. I think that many of the people who are involved in making this chart understand that. And so I think there's a sense that we will hopefully, um, you know, re-engage with this analysis. They did it on a very fast, what's called the fast track report. They did it in a very fast time period. And our hope is that, you know, after the further notice goes out, um, but prior to order, we'll be able to, to um, evaluate, uh, re-evaluate uh, that analysis in light of some of the new technical findings, including uh, a, a set of really interesting studies that are being uh, sponsored by industry and by, and by NTIA on how uh, broadband technology can share with military radars in this frequency range. Uh, speaking about priority access very quickly, um, this would be a, a, a tier of access that would appeal to broadband, commercial broadband users that need some kind of quality of service guarantee. Again, we've conceived this as being very technically flexible, not just small cells. Uh, it could be other types of uses as well. Um, we've recast it from the original proposal to be more uh, open in terms of the eligibility. So essentially anyone who's qualified to hold an FCC license would be qualified to apply for this tier of service. And I think, again, kind of tying back to what Jason Ferber was talking about, we are definitely thinking about this as an opportunity to think anew about our auctions, about how to resolve uh, competing applications for Spectrum, whether there's a way to do it um, in a lightweight, uh, more dynamic way. And so this will be an opportunity for innovation and invention, just like uh, on the economic side that's uh, also happening on the technology side. Uh, at the core of this uh, priority access tier is this notion of a priority access license, or PAL. Um, think of these as like Lego blocks of spectrum. They're uh, sort of standardized units in sp uh, space, time, and frequency. I wanted to call them priority access unit licenses, or PALs. The, some of you may know Paul Powell is the sort of lead attorney on this thing. He vetoed that. Um, this is his chance to have a, his name in history, I guess. But um, anyway, so uh, but think of this as a, as a, as a, you know, a very sort of the fundamental unit of licensing in the band. Um, 
it would be granular. Uh, so we think of them as relatively small by spectrum standards, uh, shorter time durations that people are maybe accustomed to, smaller geographies, um, and some standardized amount of bandwidth, perhaps 10 megahertz. Um, they would be aggregable, so if you need longer time horizon for, for your use, you can acquire multiple years. If you need more geography, you can acquire multiple uh, area licenses that are contiguous or non-contiguous. And if you need more than 10 megahertz, you can acquire multiple frequency chunks. The idea is uh, allow the, with you taking advantage of the fact that the spectrum access system can handle a, a large number of licenses, um, make it very flexible to accommodate a wide different, a widely divergent uh, set of use cases. And frankly, and, and lastly, they would also be tradable. So the idea is that they would, uh, one of the thoughts here is that we would like to, you know, Spectrum has a lot of administrative uh, requirements associated with if you're a Spectrum licensee, you have a lot of filing obligations, paperwork, so forth. And the idea is we want to try to find ways to streamline um, uh, secondary mar market transactions with respect to these PALs. So you asen essentially end up almost with a commodity exchange of PALs. And at the limit, you can have people on the outside of the SEC inventing new auction models and exchange models uh, to allow some of the more dynamic spot market pricing concepts and things that others have come up with. And, and uh, you don't have to wait for the government to do it. It'll be up to people on the outside to implement the, uh, in the private sector to do that, that kind of work. Okay, and then uh, general authorized access. Um, the notion here is that it would be licensed by rule. Uh, that's, in a sense, it's a different legal mechanism, but has many of the same characteristics as an unlicensed um, uh, use, as I mentioned before. Again, same level of technical flexibility. You could use it for all kinds of different uh, technical applications. GAA must pr protect other tiers above it, including the priority access uh, tiers, and GAA users also have to accept interference from other GAA users. Um, in the uh, draft notice, there's this concept of a minimum floor of nationwide availability of GAA to ensure that there's always some GAA spectrum available. Uh, this was in our public uh, uh, notice from last fall as well. Um, and also the concept that the GAA uh, could operate in places where the PAL is not active. Um, so that when PAL uh, spectrum is not being used, it reverts to GAA, um, increasing the, the use. And this is a concept I think Michael has probably been the number one uh, champion of as far as I'm aware. Uh, he talks about it all the time. Um, and then finally, the spectrum access system, um, you know, just a few facts. It's sort of modeled on our TV white spaces system. The, the draft rules that we came up with have taken from that experience. So we took advantage of the 10-year experience and boiled it down to um, a few months. But we had to add some things, and we'll see where that ends up uh, as the comments come in. Uh, very dependent on this notion of geolocation. Um, open to the idea that there will be multiple uh, third-party private sector data, uh, database uh, spectrum access system administrators and that they will need to coordinate with each other, which is going to be challenging, frankly, because there's a lot more to coordinate than in the TV white space uh, domain. And the idea behind this, and I think this is an idea that several of the commenters uh, proposed to us along the way, is that this can kind of create a race to the top um, kind of dynamic where you've got different uh, private sector uh, um, uh, administrators coming with their own ideas of how to implement things. and trying to build you know, faster, better, cheaper uh, SAS systems that can ex extend the range of capability. So uh, looking ahead, where are we? We are looking, at least where I said, we are looking very much to, the, to April 23rd, which is the commission meeting. Um, the, the commissioners just received a draft of this proposal. It, as I said, it could change. Uh, they'll undoubtedly want to weigh in on, with some of their concerns. Um, uh, after it's voted out, if it is voted out, um, there will be a, a comment cycle, um, a healthy one, so that we can get uh, detailed comments on our detailed proposals. And then simultaneously, as the comments are coming in, we expect to be doing more work with NTIA and DOD on uh, the uh, relationship with the incumbent federal users. And hopefully, um, we'll be able to um, involve the uh, industry in that as well, um, so that we can get the benefit of, um, of a lot of the technical uh, knowledge that comes out that's, that's outside the government. That's where we are. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, John. So um, if we can ask, I guess, everybody, you all, to come back up up here because we're going to have so, just uh, you know some comments, some brief comments by our PCAST, uh, PCAST members and invited experts. Um, the people who actually went through this process and did the work. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm just going to introduce uh, me. Introduce you know Mark, Craig, and Milo. Just just and you can go right down right down the line and just you know kind of give us your your retrospective as well as kind of looking forward in terms of 
what you've heard today. So Mark Warnberg is, a, of course, a member of PCAST and also founder and managing director of Zeta Venture Partners. And I should note that uh, uh, John mentioned Tom Wheeler's speech last week, Monday, and, and Chairman Wheeler uh, singled out, Mark wasn't there, but he singled him out by name and, uh, and praised him for his uh, tireless uh, and collaborative leadership of this effort and in bringing it home in a very comprehensive and ambitious way. Uh, Craig Mundy is also a member of PCAST and a currently senior advisor to the CEO at Microsoft. Uh, and of course, he's the former uh, chief research and strategic officer uh, and strategy officer of, of, of Microsoft. And Milo Medin uh, is, is a, was an invited expert on PCAST and made a major contribution to uh, the conceptualization and writing. Um, he's vice president of access services at Google, where he manages the Google Fiber and wireless access initiatives. So I don't know, if Mark, since you were our fearless leader, uh, if you have a few words. Um, well, Michael, thank you. And uh, thank you and Alan for hosting us here today. And uh, and by the way, for your leadership as well and, and all the work that we've been doing, I remember the very first time we got together and you talked about the whole notion of sharing. I think your concept was use it or share it at the time, um, which resonated uh, quite a bit. Um, it was uh, both an honor and a humbling experience to be part of this group. Um, it was truly a collaborative effort, and um, it, which included uh, six members of PCAST and uh, 20 what I would call technical and policy advisors economic advisors that helped us along the way. Uh, in terms of PCAST members, uh, none any more than Craig Monday, and it's really great that he's here today to share his thoughts. He truly is the one that first brought this idea forward within PCAST, which has a very high bar for choosing topics to go after. Uh, and, you know, because it has to be at the nexus of both technology and policy and feel like it's going to have an impact. and. Uh, and truly, it was his uh, leadership in pushing the idea forward that even got it on the table, as well as sort of all the architectural ideas that he brought forward in the framework that really led us to where we are today. Um, and, um, and, and Milo, of course, uh, in terms of, I think, really being the uh, forward thinker on what became termed the SAS, the Spectrum Access System, the three-tier system. I and mean, we, we, as geeks, called it a geolocation database, and of course, brought it into PCAST, and Eric Lander said, I don't, what is that? What does it do? Well, it gives you access to spectrum. Well, why don't you just call it a spectrum <laughs> access system? So uh, it's very amazing that that term actually stuck, you know, and here we are today uh, with that term. Um, you know, uh, Tom and John have just been uh, tireless in their work, and they've already outlined the report as well as the amazing work they've done to to, to put their own body English on it and make it real, both through the amazing rulemaking that started really with um, uh, Chairman Jedikowski's speech back in September of 2012, and then the vote by the commissioners right, in December, unanimous vote by the commissioners in December of that year. And of course, um, Tom, who is um, truly the architect of the presidential memorandum uh, that came out in the middle of 2013, and is really sort of the day-to-day the -day a leader of the um, a work that's done on the Spectrum Policy Team. Um, and I will say it was really a pleasure to see Mike Marcus here, who at the very first meeting that we had uh, dogged us about this idea from the 70s of the importance of having leadership in the White House. And sure enough, um, here we, uh, we move forward with that. Um, the work by the FCC TAC uh, was really instrumental as a sort of adjacent group while we were working on this report. And uh, it is very serendipitous that the, the chair of the Technology Advisory Council of the FCC at the time was Tom Wheeler. So there's been huge continuity, I think, from the work that went on at that time back in 2011, 2012, you know, to here we are today. Um, so I'm not going to go through uh, the report per se. Uh, I don't think after these talks that that's really uh, something that you need to hear. But I do want to tell you some of the things that excite me going forward. One is, uh, I'm very excited that what we're doing is actually an evolution of the technologies that were already there. Uh, these are not new revolutionary technologies that are the impediment to actually getting things going forward. This is truly an evolutionary path, which is why we were able to get things up and running so quickly. Um, the new ideas that people have, 
they'll come along. They'll make it even better. They'll make it even better. Um, but um, they are not necessary impediments to, uh, to moving forward with it. Um, uh, the second one is that um, the, uh, you know, when the PCAST report was being worked on, the broadband, uh, the, the, the national broadband plan uh, came out two years earlier. Uh, I think Blair Levin is here, who is really the sort of uh, writer and sort of leader of that report. Uh, and um, um, at that point in time, the NTIA was tasked to come up with bans. And the first one they put forward was the 3.5 ban. And of course, using the old rules, it wasn't commercially viable. And so it sat. Well, then as the PCAST ideas came forward and, and started to be brought forward uh, by, uh, by all the different folks involved, particularly um, over at the FCC, the commercial world got excited about it. So that's 150 megahertz that really is on the table now for commercial use that truly was not on the table for commercial use uh, just before. And that's just the beginning. And I think uh, John outlined this in his comments that it came right out of the PCAST report that this is uh, just the start of many bands. The NTIA is hard at work. And uh, so I think we'll see a lot more spectrum come forward, particularly as we work through this process with 3.5 and start to show success uh, in it. Um, the second thing that most that excites me is that industry has really stepped up and will be a strong part of this and is already working on ideas in this area and building prototypes and will be building systems for this. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that from uh, Craig and Milo. Um, the economic theory that Jason talked about is very exciting to me because once you put this in place, what does that mean? Well, people wondered if we were positive about auctions. We are extremely positive about auctions. We're probably more positive about auctions than even the folks who are involved in designing auctions because we have, you know, a vision of auctions being automated. We have a vision of them being uh, uh, routine. We have a vision of them being, you know, basically computer driven almost. We use the analogy of AdWords, you know, that were being worked on every day in, you know, Google access systems. Uh, so, I mean, that's to the point where we see Spectrum being traded in these sort of medium and short term licenses and the ability to have different kinds of, um, you know, economic models about them is, is a very exciting thing. Um, the implementation of the PCAST report. Um, will have huge benefits to the federal agencies, particularly the DOD, um, you know, ensuring continuity of mission and avoiding major costs associated with the changes they had to go through before and making spectrum available for the commercial world, uh, enabling military agile systems to leverage commercial products, uh, to simplify a lot of the training and frequencies on a shared basis, and to increase U.S. military effectiveness by deploying environments um, and um, making it um, better for them to uh, be able to work and leverage um, sort of these local systems. Um, and that's something, uh, and Preston Marshall's here, he spent a long time on this today at Google, before that at, uh, at DARPA, you know, really espousing a number of these ideas going forward. Uh, and then of course, uh, in the model city that was talked about, we've changed, word, upgraded the wording from test city to model city because that seems much more appropriate to what we're talking about. Um, and let me just end this by saying that um, I think this is critical for uh, U.S. leadership. I think this is going to be another piece of this golden age of mobile use, not just communications as we've seen it, but a forerunner to the next 10 years of the proliferation of the Internet of Things uh, and small cells and uh, a whole use of wireless that we don't even see uh, today. And I think what I'm most proud of uh, for all of us is that you know, when we released the report, we thought that we could get meaningful access to shared spectrum within three years. I think that's actually in our sight, and that's just an amazing feeling to know you got to work on something that has the opportunity to sort of live to the plan that it had set off. So uh, those are the comments I'd like to make. All right. Uh, Craig? Thank you. Uh, I want to certainly commend everyone who's been involved in this, and especially Mark. He was a fantastic partner to me in, in working through this with many people in PCAST and like he, uh, I'm very proud of, of what has been achieved. Uh, I was around at the very beginning of what became the TV White Spaces work and was one of the steady evangelists. That took eight years to get to the vote at the FCC. 
But it was important because when I th thought then and, and think now about the future of wireless communication writ large, you know, I think what ultimately is required is a complete, pretty much wholesale change uh, of how that is done. And in 2000, when we started with the white spaces idea and, and how that would be mediated, it was out of desperation, really, uh, because we saw the value of, of unlicensed spectrum uh, and we didn't see where we were going to get much more of it, particularly to deal with wider area communication. Uh, the Congress had basically just the classical view of auctioning off the spectrum, and as a result, you know, there wasn't much left over, uh, none in fact. And so the white spaces sharing was essentially a way of recognizing that there was spectrum available. It just wasn't uh, going to be a available on a traditional uh, basis. And that led to the spectrum access, you know, concept, uh, and, and a number of us uh, performed implementations of that. And I think that it, it really was a great warm-up exercise for this. So when I think of where we are now, you know, once this rulemaking is complete and many of these processes really hit their stride, I think we'll, we will have looked back and seen the white space activity as sort of the crawl model, uh, the crawl phase, that, that what we're doing right now will be sort of the walk phase, and ultimately there will be a run phase. And, and PCAST contemplated that uh, when it, it basically said, well, let's get, you know, get a thousand megahertz, a gigahertz and, and of contiguous and make it into one band into which all of the new models of communication can, can be designed and coexist. You know, it was with, uh, you know, quite a, almost amazement, I'll say, that many of us who worked on this when we released it in 2012 recognized that it had been literally exactly 100 years uh, from the time that, that some of the forcing functions, like the sinking of the Titanic, uh, you know, drove the country into the then existing model of spectrum allocation and management. And it hadn't really evolved. And when you think of spark gap radios of the day, <laughs> you know, as, as the thing we were designing for, and you look at the capabilities we have in digital electronics, you know, you really realize, wow, you know, we really are squandering a huge amount of utility simply because we haven't updated the model. So, but we also recognize that the world has a huge sunk investment in, in these systems. And so, you know, things like the, the uh, spectrum currency concept were really important because we realized if we're going to make it to the run phase, you know, which is more than just the convenient aggregation of, of currently adjacent things. And we're going to get to a world maybe 20, 30 more years from now uh, where everything has been recast into the new model. You have to contemplate, you know, what is the replacement cycle of virtually all the radios on the planet, uh, including those in, in space. And so we, you know, are not naive in terms of understanding how long that might take, but we definitely have to put mechanisms in place. And to the extent that, that all of these things do drive the economy, not just in the classical sense, in, at least in my mind, of, of mobile broadband, you know, which is driving the current use, but in a world where everything is going to be instrumented and communicate, and, that, and that'll just be how things operate, one of the big costs associated with that, if you didn't have a broad wireless capability, is you'd have to go back and wire everything up. And that in itself, you know, would be a big cost barrier to, to broad diffusion of this into the society and the economy. And so, you know, I think we're going to have an unbelievably rich use of broadband and wireless communications of all ilk, not just in the ways we see it today. And that that, you know, that, that fertile ground that's created will be exploited by the steady evolution of the technology. And we're really through this mechanism, just in the bootstrapping phase of, of a complete rethink of, of what radios will be architected to be and what we will do with them and where we'll put them. So I think it is a, a great achievement for the country at this point to be this far along in this short a time. And, uh, and I'm very happy that, that we've gotten where we are. So thanks to everyone that's been involved. Well, yeah, sure. Um, uh, like uh, others who participate in the effort, uh, it really is amazing to see Tom and John and the folks at the FCC move so aggressively on their side, but also Tom Power and, and the folks on the DOD side and, and NTA, Larry uh, Strickling and company. Um, I have to admit, when Eric Schmidt asked me to 
participate in this working group, I sort of said, I don't really want to do that because I don't think anything's going to happen uh, as a result of this. But he said, no, 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 there is strong leadership uh, in this White House on this topic. And so um, uh, I, I uh, participated and- uh, Under and duress. A little <laughs> under duress, but uh, it turned out to be uh, very worthwhile. And it's really great to see the amazing progress. I think folks here who are familiar with the somewhat glacial time frames it takes to get Spectrum into service in this country um, are, I think, share my amazement at the level of leadership and the level of commitment to getting this band into service uh, and this uh, model. I think, um, you know, the PCAST uh, report created a great agenda for regulators as well as uh, government folks, but also industry, uh, not, um, uh, you know, allowing industry to come in and really be a partner and spec out and operate these systems um, like the SAS, uh, I think has been um, uh, uh, great. Um, we on the industrial side are working hard to try and make it a reality. And as, you know, Craig pointed out, the roots of this are really in the experience in the TV white spaces database. Uh, that system is up and running. There are commercial devices now available that can actually use those, use those bands. And uh, perhaps the greatest uh, testimony to that, uh, the viability of the approach is that other countries are starting to adopt that same framework. And uh, imitation really is the uh, fondest uh, form of uh, uh, flattery. Um, I think uh, from our perspective, we've been uh, you know, working hard. Uh, we have a, a demonstration uh, SAS system that we put together that operates in two 20 megahertz wide uh, channels in the BRS band at our offices in Mountain View. And uh, you can see uh, incumbent users and turning protected users on and pushing uh, GAA users out. We have code that uh, does that, and we're um, uh, working on uh, a new code base that we think will be um, uh, a good candidate for certification by the FCC and hopefully the NTIA and be consistent with uh, whatever rules are adopted by the commission that can actually make this uh, be a reality in the 3.5 band. Uh, I think many folks have said, um, you know, 3.5 is interesting, but it's too high to be useful. Um, I really think it's important to realize the only way we're really going to get um, multiples, right, 10x, 20x, 50x capacity in broadband networks, whether they be uh, Wi-Fi based or, or uh, cellular, is by densification, smaller and smaller cells uh, fed by very high speed networks like fiber. Uh, and these bands is where you've got propagation that doesn't go far. Uh, it turns out 3.5 is great for that. And so I think um, uh, the work here to empower both cellular operators, institutions, uh, and, uh, and just normal uh, citizens buying retail products to use the band are going to generate a lot of economic uh, benefit. Uh, one of the things to, I think, that I know that was always on John's mind, uh, about the use of this band is you can imagine situations where you've got a hospital or an institution uh, they could take Wi-Fi technology but they're worried about it from being interfered with well now they could actually put protection around that and use that as their own kind of core enterprise institutional system um, or you could actually see them use LTE technology right um, and actually build their own small LTE networks in this band um, and, and leverage all the commercial development there. So I think there, it's, it's beyond just the use case of traditional unlicensed and traditional um, cellular uh, operation. I think that's one of the really exciting things to see, uh, that this kind of flexibility and really making the spectrum available on a broad basis can, can yield. I think, um, you know, I think one of the other uh, dynamics here is, you know, allowing operators to choose uh, what model uh, we, uh, they deploy their services in. You could imagine a cellular operator starting off as a GAA node, uh, and then if it detects inter interference, then decide to pay for protection. Uh, and so we don't have to have this, I, I think what PCAST really tried to do is avoid this fight about licensed versus unlicensed, and recognize that the spectrum use in the future is really not going to be one or the other. There will be hybrid models, and we want to have a framework a technical framework and hopefully a licensing framework that really incorporates that. So I think there's a lot of uh, advantages there. And then lastly, I just want to say I think there's a lot of advantages to the federal users as well. Um, you know, when I worked for NASA uh, about uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, the 
capabilities, the, all of the high-end R&D and in, uh, communications was being done in, in the federal sector and military sector. Uh, that is not true anymore. Uh, that's all now in the commercial sector. And uh, not having commercial devices in federal bands means that they're isolated from being able to take advantage of the developments and miniaturization and that we all take it for granted in, in things like this uh, smartphone. Uh, so the ability to actually share a federal band, get commercial equipment that has cost reduced, highly integrated, low power, and be able to use those devices in their federal operations, I think can uh, yield a tremendous uh, improvement in productivity and capability because uh, I know that uh, military forces, as well as many federal users, they have increasing requirements for networking and connectivity, not decreasing. And decreasing budgets, increasing requirements, and pressure on spectrum, I think this approach to sharing where we can really leverage technology in all these sectors, uh, including the federal sector, is going to be uh, very useful. And I think 3.5 creates a, is an ideal place to start, but I think uh, uh, I think all of us view it as the beginning and not the end. So with that, I will end. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> really looking forward to, to when that foundation can be used for the running <laughs> that, that Craig talked about, because that's when we're going to get that. And we're going to need it, uh, the 100x uh, going to need it. capacity compared to today if we really want pervasive connectivity at higher speeds and affordable prices. We're running overtime, so I just want to go direct to see if, if we can take, can you all stay for a few questions? Um, if we have, uh, uh, take, can take a few questions, f you know, right now from the audience or if, uh, I don't know if the, we have a way to get it from the webcast, but uh, tell us who you're, who, you know, who you are uh, when you ask the question as well. So, yeah, right back. Melin Budikot, uh, Bell Labs, uh, New Jersey. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, say that uh, PCAS definitely represents a monumental achievement in terms of pushing the new type of spectrum sharing architectures forward and uh, we owe uh, gratitude to all of you for the great work that you have done. My question is somewhat philosophical. Uh, I think uh, just to draw on Andy uh, Groh's uh, famous quote, only the paranoid survive, right? Only the paranoid survive, uh, prosper. Um, what is your greatest hope and what is your greatest fear when it comes to shared spectrum ecosystem going forward? Greatest hope and greatest fear. Well, I'll give, I'll give you one answer. Uh, my greatest hope is that, in fact, we come to appreciate that, it, that the real leverage comes from the wholesale replacement of our, of our entire use of spectrum. And while we recognize that that can't happen overnight, we have to internalize that that is the opportunity. And and so my greatest fear to some extent is that this thing gets piecemealed apart, you know, into, well, we'll do a little here and a little there, and that we won't, as a society and, and as, as a sort of a, a total enterprise as a nation, uh, agree that we are ultimately going to force everyone, you know, up to the new model. Uh, that, you know, y y my greatest fear is, that you, ha you know, people call the convoy problem, you know, the, that the, you don't go – any faster than the slowest ship in the convoy. And, you know, there's always people who will be reticent or feel they won't make the economic investment to do it. And I just think that, you know, this again will take leadership by, you know, by both the administration in the, in the government side and the FCC for the rest of the society, you know, to basically by license expiration or whatever means, create the environment where people do realize that it has to be in the plan, that there will be a date certain by which the country, and through this effort, the world, you know, comes out the other side in, uh, in a completely uh, reconstituted model of, of spectrum utilization. Anyone else? Um, other questions? Yes, John. Hi, uh, John Peahock, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Mark, you mentioned the, I guess now the model city, which is not something I've heard about a lot about since the report. Is there, is there, is there activity there, and might we expect something in the future? And what, what should we hope to get out of it if it's going forward? Well, 
Well, it's nice of you to ask me, but I'm going to defer that to Tom. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, <coughs> there's not been any formal action yet. It's uh, uh, it, it, one of the more intriguing ideas from the from the PCAST report. It was something that, as we were uh, thinking up or, or coming up with the initiatives we wanted to kick off, uh, for whatever reason, it, it it was not on that list, but it's been something on the drawing board certainly for a while. And right now, it's at a, a informal stage. But certainly, John and I and Julie and folks at NTIA and, and others are uh, talking about it regularly uh, and trying to figure out what's the what's the right way forward. I think, yeah, as I briefly said, um, the the idea here, you know, Mark mentioned we've we've sort of uh, recast it from test city to model city. The idea being there is we don't want it to be just sort of uh, basic R and D kind of testing. We want it to be uh, business models or technologies that are are pr pretty much ready for prime time, but need some more uh, uh, testing uh, at, at at that end of the testing phase. Um, and what you could imagine is some city that wants to stand up to the uh, uh, step forward to participate, who, as I said earlier, would be amenable to uh, all sorts of cooperation when it comes to granting access to rights of way and easements and things like that. Uh, you could imagine some industry consortium or, or individual individual uh, industry player or academic um, uh, having a, one or a variety of ideas coming together and then going to perhaps doing an MOU with the, with the city. And I'm just making this up for now. This is just one flavor of this. But doing an MOU with the city to say we're going to cooperate on this, coming to the FCC, saying we want an experimental license either for some particular uh, uh, business model or technology or more broad ranging, FCC would go coordinate with that that with NTIA to the extent that there are federal interests involved. Um, so a lot of the pieces are there. We're just trying to sort of think about how do we convene it and be the bully pulpit and push it forward. One of the things uh, that would have to happen to the extent that there are federal interests there is uh, protection of them as well as incumbent commercial users depending on what bands you're in. Um, and so you could imagine some uh, kind of uh, program office to, to manage this, to monitor it to study it, to feed the data back to the, the, the consortium, to back to the Boulder Labs where we've got, you know, our folks working. Um, and, you know, to protect the incumbents and, you know, maybe you've got a big kill switch if you need it, depending on what's going on and you need to protect the incumbents. I'm, like I said, this is just, uh, this is pretty inchoate at this point, but these are the kind of things we're talking about. And then how do we formalize that in establishment? And, you know, we don't want to be dictating much of this in terms of technology or business models or anything like that. We just want to enable uh, the the private sector to to have as much flexibility to move forward. And John, I don't know if you've got. I think that's. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say one of the things you need for a test city is actually equipment that can operate in the band. Uh, one of the nice things about this particular band is you got 3650, which is already in service as quote lightly licensed, and we would expect those devices, which are based on modified Wi-Fi parts, um, to actually come into this band and be available relatively quickly after both the SAS and the rulemaking is, is done. Um, uh, typically the kind of highly integrated multi-band radios that you see in LTE cellular ser service, you, you may take 18 months or 24 months before they find their way into parts uh, that are integrated in the handsets. So I think uh, we'll see much more of that kind of initial uh, deployment in using uh, Wi-Fi style devices, but again, we could protect them. There are different use models for those, and I think we have some opportunity to actually see some things happen pretty quickly once the rules are authorized. Okay. There's a question back uh, in the back there. Hi. So, yeah, uh, Anand Sahai from Berkeley, and uh, I've got a question relating to uh, this idea of balkanization of the bands. I mean, with the TV white space is really kind of leading the way in this style, is there a thought to, once the SAS stuff gets ready in 3.5, to then reunify into a common framework with the, the TV white spaces, to sort of have one style of operation? Uh, that, that's sort of, it's one question. The second question related, related to the SAS, again, is to the extent that the SAS is providing essentially a replacement for the old style paper pushing regulation for assignments. Is there a thought to, to what extent um, transparency 
is required in the operation of the SaaS, in particular, for example, core functiona func functionality being open sourced, certain protocols being clearly visible and released, auditable, and so on. And we'll remember that SAS is the spectrum access system that's being proposed to sort of manage access. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the framework that we're thinking about for, um, for the interacting with the SAS is much broader than that of the TV white space uh, model. One of the things we want to make sure we do is um, you may not have, if you authorize one device into the band in a particular location, that may not that may not mean you can uh, let a thousand other devices into the band and still protect either incumbents or the uh, uh, pr uh, protected uh, access licensees. So the SAS has to be able to handle that. Uh, and so I think we need a framework for communication with the SAS, which is a superset of that of the TV white space. That said, there's no reason why that couldn't be retrofitted into that um, uh, community as well. I think, um, you know, I think the uh, transparency is an important item because if you have the ability to actually, it's not so much on the code, but as much as um, being able to see what's registered, uh, the ability to verify that you've got a base station actually operating somewhere, I think that uh, allows a, a level of, um, uh, of sort of public enforcement, I won't say in, enforcement the classic FCC way. But if somebody is, says they've got a base station commission and is operating, but there's no RF coming out of it after two months, then I think that breeds a level of, of interactivity that is hopefully the marketplace will, um, will um, be able to discipline. The other thing I think that helps with that and doesn't require, for example, open source as a way to gain it is we start with the assumption we're going to have multiple parallel implementations that are independent. But for the system to work, they have to be completely interconnected. So if they're sharing everything and they're looking at it, I mean, in a sense, they're auditing each other because it, if, if you say, well, I saw these things come in, but I, why did that happen? Right. You know, you either have a bug or you have a problem. So I think that, the, in a sense, having completely parallel independent implementations that have to operationally be integrated and reconciled is probably the best possible way to ensure that, that, that fairness is, is always there. I just, I, I just want to say, first of all, I think that's a very insightful, that's a very insightful question, and I hope you will uh, consider uh, at the right time uh, looking at the notice and perhaps responding to it or make sure we're focused on the right issues. I think um, in addition to the things that were just said, I think one of the key things to remember, and people, I think, as the excitement level about 3.5 has gone up, people sometimes forget this is a band that is a uh, currently a federal band with, you know, a lot of uh, incumbent use. And um, I think one of the... Uh, you know, conditions or preconditions for gaining access to that use is trust. And uh, we're not going to have trust if there's not a sense from the federal side right. that they can validate that the system is behaving the way it should be um, and, you know, enforcing where it should be. The other thing I would add is that we're very interested, I think, in the extent to which when you have systems deployed, the systems themselves can perform some kind of enforcement-like function. and. Um, you know, I think uh, we had some ideas that were just mentioned about related to sort of the back-end communication between the SAS providers, but also, you know, the nodes themselves ought to be doing a bunch of measurements. I mean, LTE systems do a lot of system measurements. There's no reason why some of that data can't be passed back Absolutely. to, um, to uh, you know, facilitate, automate some of the enforcement, make sure that base station really is there that says it is where it is. Yeah. And one other caveat that was in the PCAST report is that, of course, and particularly on for, on 3.5, for example, with where these federal incumbents John refers to are, you know, mostly naval radar, is that there's some classified uses that won't be fully transparent, and, you know, that will have to be accommodated in terms of the design of the database and possibly even two different databases that talk to each other. Um, and and, and that, that was part of the discussions at the workshop that John organized. So one, one last question, but it'll have to be, you know, quick and fire, because person in the back has their hand up from the beginning. Hi, Jeff Marks with Alpha Lucent. Um, there is built into this shared access system is a sharing between the GAA and the, um, the um, priority access uh, temporally. And my question is, is, is there an expectation that with, with commercial uses sharing with the government that there will also be not only a geolocation aspect to it, but a temporal aspect to it so that if, if there are no ships at port, for example, that some very valuable areas will be opened up. 
I'm happy to. Oh. Well, I was going to say, I think that's, that's true, but I think it works the other way as well. That is to say, one of the things we need to recognize is these are federal bans, and incumbent use may grow, not just shrink. And so um, the system needs to be able to deal with the fact that a new federal user may come in and invalidate even protected use, right? So I think those are the kind of things that we need to deal with. In general, the radars, you know, I think um, their use uh, in, even in port is something that's being explored right now with a number of tests. And so I think we'll have good data to base those conclusions on. But ultimately, it'll be up to the user, I mean, the, whether it's a GAA user or a protected user, whether or not they're willing to deal with that kind of temporal use or not. Uh, it's a new resource, uh, spectral resource, and if it turns out to be valuable enough, there are some use models where I'm sure that would be fine, and others it might not be okay. So we'll just see how that, how that evolves. When we did the original report, you know, we recognize everybody kind of recognizes you got frequency <coughs> historically plus time and space, right. but, but there's actually many other sort of orthogonal, you know, ways of separating these things. Uh, and, and each of them just depends on more sophisticated equipment. And so over time, you know, we think that, that you know, you'll want to get as many dimensions as possible into the right. spectrum access system, you know, so that any way you can divide these things that are, are, are uh, you know, that where they, quote, don't interfere. I mean, one of the things we, it also was part of the report and I think is moving ahead too, is the idea that now we should have receiver standards. Mm -hmm. You know, we never had them for 100 years, and that actually, you know, creates lots of problems like the light squared problem and others. And, you know, so yeah. if we're gonna change all the radios, you know, then ultimately you wanna change both ends of this thing such that you can have, you know, much better management of that total non-interfering, you know, uh, environment. And so I think it'll be a, a, a great opportunity for innovation there. Yeah, I just want to add real quick, the idea of starting off conservatively and then optimizing over time, I think is a principle that we advocated in the PCAST uh, com committee and I think the FCC is taking on. Um, we can do something very simple and very clean and very reliable uh, to begin with and then optimize it with new techniques, reduce the area of, of protection, uh, you know, to what's really required. But we can start off conservative and I think be really assured that we're going to get a system that will work. And we don't have to get e everything done uh, uh, at the start. Yeah, I just, I, that was actually, the, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I, I think especially when you're dealing with, um, you know, military systems that I think, you know, people who see the world through a broadband communications lens have to remind themselves these are extremely important systems. Right. They do things that you don't think about and don't want to think about. Um, they need to work when they need to work, and you know I think with good reason that there are uh, concerns about you know sharing information about them with um, you know making them uh, somehow continue you know uh, you know key to the you know the, the operation of a commercial system, and th th I think all that goes to what Milo just said that we need to build confidence, we need to take things step by step, and you know show each step along the way that it, it works, it can work. There will undoubtedly be some glitches and problems. They have to be sure that there's a a, a track record of fixing them quickly and and moving on and so um, you know I think some of the more sensitive controversial issues from the federal side are things that may happen a little later in the process what we want to do I think now is establish the framework so that that can roll out over time all right. well that's that's all very uh, very optimistic I think um, all right well I want to give uh, give you all a chance to, to escape here, since I said we're over time, and I know a couple of our panels have planes to catch and other things. Uh, but please join me in uh, thanking the, uh, all the speakers, and thanks to you all for engaging in such a geeky time.